kindness. Uh, if any of you are bothered by the fact of my slow progress in healing, I will gladly give you a list of all doctors that I have visited that have done nothing for me, and you can kindly write them a letter and let them know your disappointment. Certainly, I, I intend to, when I am better, to let them know my disappointment as well. Um, one of the best known literary figures of the 18th century was a man named Samuel Johnson, a very robust individual who was an incredible uh, literary figure, wrote a lot of books. He wrote especially a, a thing called Dictionary and also uh, on Shakespeare, Milton, all these poetry stuff. And uh, James Boswell actually wrote a, a biography of him. And actually it's a, one of the best, if not the best biography I've ever read about a person. Sometimes when someone writes a biography about someone, you're like, and you're like, oh, wow, I don't want to read that person. I remember when I read Paul Elmer Moore. First I read him. Thank God I read him first because when I read a biography, I was so boring. I was like, wow, horrible, like sawdust. But James Boswell captures so well the character and wit of this man. He was a very devout Christian. He actually wrote prayers. Some of those prayers are still used by the Church of England. He was a man who did not indulge in just verbal, uh, uh, you know, language for the sake of language and he cared, he had no malice, he was not a bitter, he was not a person who was uh, horrible towards other men. And one time James Boswell says to, said to him, why do you invite people over when they st come here and this, after all this conversation there's really nothing much of value or any, anything worth remembering of what they said. And he says, memorably he said to them, to eat and drink together and to promote kindness. Wow, kindness. It's such a virtue that is so underrated, especially even among Christians, you know, kindness, such a simple thing. But later on we'll see, when we eventually come to the end of this passage, that it's one of the things that defines God. God is kind, and we are to be like him. You may, can you imagine if God wasn't kind? Can you imagine if God was sarcastic towards you? When you came to him in prayer to complain, like I've been complaining, or you complain about whatever you want to complain about, whatever you're going through, and you say to him, or you share your feelings, and he's just you know, sarcastic or bitter towards you? Can you imagine if you go to God and you worship Him and you pray to Him and then you find that He's talking behind your back to somebody else and calling you an idiot? I can't believe He prays that. What a moron. How would you feel? It'd be hor horrible. Imagine if God lost His temper. He certainly could lose His temper with me in these last eight, nine weeks because I've lost my temper with Him a number of times and I kept waiting for the thunderbolt but there wasn't, thank God, uh, because He is kind and He's merciful. And this is the kind of people that we are to be. Now, there, in pl plenty of religions have gods who are portrayed as sarcastic and nasty and bitter and unkind, but not our God. The sweetness, the kindness of our God is seen everywhere in Scripture, especially in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, who demonstrated the great love and mercy of God. And we need to embrace that. You know, Christians cannot simply just let go of it and think, uh, that kindness and mutual forgiveness, mutual kindness, mutual love is not important. It is essential to the church. It is essential to how we deal with each other. You know, this passage is full of, um, chuck full of ideas on how to grow up. How to grow to the full maturity of Jesus Christ. How to be like him. Because this is all the character of Christ he's explaining here. And we need to do that. Uh, we can't have the mentality, that, well, I'm just the way that I am. And that's just the way God made me, and I just go with the flow. No, no. There's a beautiful passage in Psalms that says that I am like a stubborn horse. I'm like a stubborn mule. You know, I'm like an animal so wild, and God is taming me. God is changing me. And that's what God wants to do. Uh, we have been untamed. We need to become tamed. And so the first thing he says about kindness is that we should stop lying and tell the truth. Look at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now, what he actually says, he's actually quoting from, he's referencing a passage in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16, where it says, These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Uh, that's where he's getting the idea from. And, and of course, the context of Zechariah chapter 8 is that God tells the people of Israel, I'm going to restore your fortunes. I'm going to bring you back. And one of the things that will demonstrate that indeed you have been restored is that you speak truthfully to each other. And Paul here is saying that the church is the fulfillment of that. The church is the people of God. They are the Israel of God. They are the new Jerusalem. And 
just so you know, I did write this sermon prior. I was working prior to Mr. Trump, President Trump making a statement. So uh, I'm not doing it on purpose. Um, we are the Jerusalem of God. We are the people of God. And the, one of the things that demonstrates that we are the people of God is that we speak truthfully to each other, that we have integrity, that we're transparent with each other, that we're not trying to be uh, false with each other and lie to each other and pretend with each other. You know, it's just amazing uh, how we could do that. It shows that in many ways we don't believe that the church is the body of Christ. Because imagine the body lying to itself. You know, Chrysostom said, if the eye, if the eye sees a serpent, does it deceive the foot? If the tongue tastes what is bitter, does it deceive the stomach? Of course not. But the fact is that we, although we claim to be the body of Christ, we don't believe it. We really don't believe that we are somehow connected in Christ. And that what I do harms you and what you do harms me. And that speaking bitterness and, lie, and falsehood and hatred and gossip, all these things are destructive to the body. They are destroying us. They will destroy us. Um, and yet we fool ourselves to think that they won't affect us. They will affect us. They will come back on us. Falsehood is something that Christians need to get rid of. We need to have integrity in the way that we deal with each other. We have to be honest with each other. A man wrote a book a while, a while back who said that every single person lies at least 1,000 times a day. And if you say, no, I don't lie at all, oh, that's your first one right there. Um, he says that they lie, it could be from the simplest things like saying, I'm having a great day. <laughs> when we're really not having a great day at all, <laughs> we're having a miserable day, to, oh, wow, that looks beautiful. We know we don't really think that's, especially when we have to say something about a baby or something. Like, what a beautiful baby. Like, yeah, adorable. You know, we, we always, we try, we do this all the time. Of course, then it comes to the gravity of lying about relationships and lying about business. But all of us tend to do that. But what Paul's talking about is uh, integrity, being honest with each other, that this is a qualification, this is a quality of who we are, that the people who are not Christians says Romans chapter 1, that they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They've denied God and are living in falsehood. They don't live with that integrity. They have no problem lying. They have no problem being false. We cannot be that way. Now, with that said, I always go into my little addendum here about um, just because we're to tell the truth doesn't mean we tell everything. If you come up to me and ask me my bank account, I'm not going to tell you the numbers. Uh, if you tell me how much money I have in my bank account, which is none of your business, <laughs> you know, uh, but many times people might ask me as a pastor, and I've said this before, they might say to me, hey, is, is Peter having an affair with Mary? And I learned early on that if I said, that's none of your business, <laughs> they'll think to themselves, aha, Peter is having an affair with Mary, and, and, and pastors will want to tell me about it. So I disown it, because I realize I have to protect that person. And you might say, well, that's lying. Well, I think that in a fallen world, there are times when we have to be, as, as, as children of God, we have to be shrewd as serpents. You know, during Nazi Germany, when the Germans would come in, Nazi Germans would come in, and there were German people hiding Jews, and they were hiding here and there. Imagine you come in, and, and there's a German fan, to a German family, and you're, you're the government. Of course, you should listen to the government, right? Comes in and says, do you, are you, are you, are you, do you have any Jews? It's, oh yeah, they're in the attic, in a secret compartment up there. Of course, they can say, no, we're not hiding anyone. And you might think, well, okay, that's, that's what happens in the world. Um, and, but to me, there are also biblical illustrations. And let me give you one which is not a complete lie, but it's certainly not the complete truth. In 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 3, if you ever get a chance, read that. And of course, uh, God tells uh, Samuel, go down and anoint David as king. And Samuel says to God, uh, God, if I go down to do that and Saul finds out, he will kill me. And God says, yeah, he will. You're right. You know, it goes to show that God, like, like Luis Molina, the 16th century uh, theologian said, God has full knowledge. He not, not only knows what will happen, he knows all the possibilities that can happen. He knows that if, if Samuel does tell Saul, I'm going down there, Saul would kill him. So what does he say to him? Tell him that you're going to make an offering to me. Which is true. He's going to make an offering and anoint a king. <laughs> so he doesn't tell him the whole truth. Because he knows, God knows, if you tell him, this is exactly what's going to happen. So, of course, we have to be careful with that and not, not, not allow the world to use the truth against us, to try to use the truth to destroy us. We cannot allow that. But with each other as Christians, we need to speak with integrity. Don't use the excuse of what I'm saying now to you, that there are times to lie to say, oh, I can lie all the time because pastor said there are times. No. 
The way to live is truthfully, is honestly, but there will be occasions, unfortunately, when you know that we live in a fallen world and we cannot betray the truth by telling someone something that will harm someone else. So that's the first thing he tells us. Stop lying. Secondly, stop being angry and gain control. You're like, oh, okay, wow, that's a little harder. Look at verse 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must... Oh, no. Okay, no, we don't need to deal with that one yet, sorry. I actually quoted it, but no need to. We'll get to that in a second. So the second one is anger. Now, of course, here again, there's the exception. Notice Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. You can get angry, but you can also stop yourself. Anger is not sin. It's what you do after you get angry. It's where you're allowed to go. If I become embittered and angry at somebody, I must kill it right there before it goes any further. Because then I'll bring harm to that person and to myself. So you can't stop it. Uh, of course, also there's righteous anger, which is what God has. God, has right, God gets angry. And we need to get angry too. When we see the evil in the world, when we see the injustice, when we see the horrors that are happening, we need to get angry. If you're looking at the horrors of the world and you are not angry, something is wrong with you. When we see people being butchered, genocide, when you see these people being tortured, Christians being killed all over, the, all over the globe, we need to be angry and we need to act upon that anger to change things. So there is a righteous anger. And Paul, of course, is so concerned about anger that he's going to revisit it in verse 31. But again, just like in the, 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 verse, the saying before, here he is also referencing a psalm. He is referencing Psalm 4, verse 4. It says, Tremble and do not sin. Where you are in your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Uh, and it talks about the importance of bringing sacrifices to God and not to bring sacrifices to God in bitterness, in anger, with hatred. You know, when you're going to bring something, even the scriptures tell us in Matthew that if you're going to bring something to the altar to give to God, and at that point you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, go fix your problem. Go fix your problem with them, then come and give your offering. God considers reconciliation so important that he puts it before worship. That's incredible. You know, so many things, we, sometimes we put worship above everything else. And he says, no. Right relationships. You cannot be embittered and angry against a brother or sister and think that you're going to be able to bring your sacrifice to God and it's going to be acceptable to God. He says, no, leave it there. Go fix your problem. He says, do not, do not let anger lead the way to you. Don't let the sun go down where you're still angry. And that's the idea, of course, that as the sun's going down, that's where everything used to be settled. That's when people used to get paid for their daily, daily labor, for everything. All matters would be reconciled and done at that time. It says, don't go to bed with that anger. Don't go to bed with that bitterness. Take care of it. Go speak to that first. Get reconciled. Again, this bitterness, this anger, this hatred being carried inside. It says, don't do it. Why? Because if you do, you give the devil a foothold. If you have anger, bitterness, hatred towards a brother or sister in Christ, and you're sitting here, you are, you are giving a place to a devil from where to work. The word there for foothold is that uh, uh, a base of operation. This is a place from where he can then go out to do further assaults and further things. He says, don't do that. When you are in a situation, take care of it. Don't let him have a part in your fellowship. Don't let him have a part in your service. You know, again, this is like a, an invading army. We have to be so careful. When he talks in Ephesians 6 about the spiritual warfare, we have to prepare ourselves. We have to be aware of the schemes of the evil one. You know, why, why you're angry and why you're this or that, the enemy is plotting. Oh, great. He's angry at her. Oh, she's angry at him. Awesome. Time to set up my little camp right there. Put my little tent and start working. To make the situation worse for them. And some people, of course, think that their anger is nothing. You know, I always love the illustration of a, a man who, a, someone who, a lady who was talking to a preacher. And so, well, you know, my, my anger is like a shotgun. It goes off, but it, it's over. It's over. I don't let it linger. And he said to her, yes, but have you seen the damage a shotgun makes once it is shot? Once you shoot a shotgun, the, the devastation that it brings is horrible. It's the same thing when things come out of your mouth. And you express that anger and that bitterness, the destruction you leave behind. So he says, get rid of anger. 
forgive each other, get rid of anger, reconcile. So stop lying, you know, uh, don't be angry. Thirdly here, he says, stop stealing and work hard to help others. Verse 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, must, must, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Here, of course, is re referencing the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal, don't steal. Uh, stealing, of course, is destructive not only to the person who's something that's being taken from them, and they may be deprived of something, it's also destroying the individual, because it's making them think that this is the way to move forward in life, that this is the way to succeed, this is the way to do things. And it says, no, that's the way to be destroyed. It destroys everything, it destroys the individual, it destroys society. And Paul makes it very clear that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that those who, who are of that mindset, who not only are greedy or whatever, but also those who steal, will not inherit the kingdom of God. These, these are not people who are Christians. You cannot be a Christian and make your lifestyle that of stealing from others. And yet today, how many times we see that, right? Especially all these uh, Ponzi screen, uh, schemes, right? It's amazing. What was that guy? I think I wrote down his name, Madoff. And he became, so soon I'm sure the Ponzi scheme will be called the Madoff scheme because of what he did was so horrendous. But there are people like that all the time who take advantage of other people, especially of those who are, who are powerless. And they try to take from them, oh, you know, give $50, give $100, give And they try to take and say, oh, you'll it'll multiply, give, <laughs> give $10. They try to take everything from you uh, rather than to give to you. And that we have to be so cautious. But we have to stop doing this. He says, on the contrary, work, do something useful. And the word you guys use for work is really hard labor. Um, you know, don't, don't be afraid of hard work. Don't be afraid of hard labor. Uh, have that kind of integrity. And he may have in mind, of course, the individuals in 2 Thessalonians. There were these, a group of individuals who were refusing to work. They believed that the Lord was coming soon, as there are some still today who think, that he, since he's right around the corner, and that was 2,000 years ago, since he's right around the corner, why work? Why work? Why do anything? On the contrary, they were letting the less spiritual people of the church help them. <laughs> provide for my, for my housing, provide for my food, provide everything, because I'm more spiritual than you, and I'm waiting for the Lord, so you should be taking care of me. And Paul's like, no way. <laughs> no way. He says, you know, get rid of them. That's horrible. You know, they should be working hard. You know, they should be, they should be taking care of their needs. And not only that, uh, working hard, of course, so they could provide for others. But here I make another footnote. Paul's not talking about uh, individuals who are genuinely poor. He's not talking about those who are genuinely struggling. There are people, there are families who are in need. It's not that they don't work. It's not that they're not trying to get a job. It's that they are unemployed. It's that they are struggling. It's that it's become difficult to make ends meet. Maybe uh, their medical bills, maybe their house bills, maybe something is uh, crippling them and making it difficult for them to survive. That's not who Paul's talking about. Because the Bible makes it very clear that we're to help those people. That God's heart is with those people. And that God does notice if we shun the poor, if we hurt them, if we take advantage of the widow, of the orphan. God does notice. And we need to be, we need to be aware of that and be generous towards that. But those who are healthy, those who can work, should be working. Um, and they're, and they, it gives them another motivation, not only to work and acquire, but to share with others. Certainly the primary reason for working is that we provide for ourselves and for our families. And that is a good thing. But here Paul's focus is on being a blessing to others. On being able to reach out to others and, and show charity. This was the early church. Remember the early church in Acts chapter 2? When they first started, they would gather money and keep it in a place for anyone who had need. So to be able to supply for any. So that no brother or sister in Christ would be in need. That they will always have what they, everything they needed, whether food or clothing or housing. Uh, this was part of the reason they did what they did. It was to help the, the poor among them. This is what we're to do. And certainly, what a great blessing that will be, because think about it. When someone looks at the church, and let's say they knew John. I have no Johns in my church. Eh? I always try to pick names of people I don't. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody in my congregation named Peter or something. Although I do have a Peter. He's not here today. Um, you know, if they look at John and see John was a thief, and John was swindling them, you know. He was a tax collector, and he was swindling everybody. And then they see him change. Rather than see him become a thief, they see him become a philanthropist, and giving money away, and helping people. What are they going to say? Wow, that Christianity must be true. 
That stuff is incredible. Look what it's doing. It's transforming people. We need to be that kind of person. Fourthly, he says, stop foul talk and build up others. Verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The word here about unwholesome is the idea of rotten. It's used in the Bible of a rotten tree, rotten fish, uh, things that are decaying. It says, don't let decaying things come out of your mouth. Now, one of the things, of course, I think as the King James says, coarse jesting. Um, and that's a possibility, but that's not what Paul means. He has a general view in mind. Anything that comes out of your mouth, which is disgusting, not only dirty jokes, uh, anything, gossip, uh, backbiting, slander, any kind of unwholesome things that are coming out of your mouth, he says, no, this is, this is disgusting, this is rotten, this reeks, this smells. You should have nothing to do that at all with that. On the contrary, what should be coming out of your mouth are things that are building up others. When you speak to others, do you bring them up or do you bring them down? Are you encouraging them or discouraging them? It's amazing how much of our talk, even when we say that we are encouraging, we're discouraging. You know, even our, even our compliments have insults. Oh, you're pretty good for... You're pretty good for a woman. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty good for Hispanic. I don't know, whatever, whatever people will say. You know, they have a way of complimenting at the same time slapping you with the back of their hand and, and instead of building you up. And he says, no, you should build up. Build them up. Encourage them. You know, uh, certainly one place where we see this is so important is parents. I cannot tell parents enough. I always tell my wife, if you're going to correct Abby, you know, if you're going to say anything about Abby, don't say it in front of her because Abby's a sponge. And Abby will hear it, and Abby will know. And, uh, but how horrible the parents put their children down, insult them. Oh, you're useless, oh, you're worthless, or you're this, or you're that. And then we wonder why they become useless. We wonder why, they were, you know, why so many people suffer with their inferior complex. And they feel less than what they should feel like. And think that they can do less than they could do. You know, when you see a child saying, you know, you know, I, I have no reason to believe that the world revolves around me because of, of how the way I was treated when I was growing up. It's horrible. And again, you see that all the time. I remember a professor of mine in, uh, in high school, and I think I've told this story before. In high school, he was, uh, he was he's in track, a great runner, and he was in this race where he beat a person very well known today, known for wrong reasons now, but known, Bruce Jenner. He was in a race and he beat Bruce Jenner. That's amazing to say. Anywhere you can say you beat Bruce Jenner in a race, that's pretty good. That's, that's chalk it up right there. I mean, even if you don't do anything else in life, you say, well, in high school, in a track race, I beat Bruce, <laughs> Bruce Jenner. He crossed the line. What did his father say to him? Nine seconds faster, and you would have beaten the record. Wow. Devastating. And you wonder why that child grows up with a mentality of having to be an achiever, 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 struggle, struggle, and always feeling that no matter how much they struggle, they never achieve enough. They never make it. Uh, we need to do, the goal has to be, um, for the benefit of those who listen, we are to, uh, says literally, to give grace to those who hear. To be graceful. To share God's grace and mercy with them. To build them up. Even when we confront them. Even when you correct someone, it's to build them up. It's to help them. That's what it should be. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 says, Admonish one another daily so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Admonish. Even in there, you're, you're encouraging, you're, you're, you're building up. You don't want to destroy. You don't want to dismantle people. You want to build them up. Even when you're correcting them, you want to be able to build them up. When you're, when you're correcting a child, that's what you're doing. You're correcting them, but you're doing it in a way where you want to still not destroy their personality, not hamper the beauty of who they are, but to channel it into a greater place. I don't want Abby to stop being Abby. On the contrary, I, I find Abby to be uh, so bold. I look at Abby and say, oh my goodness, I wish I was like that when I was <laughs> three years old. My goodness, she's got a bold personality. I was a very quiet kid. You know, you would never know what I was thinking, what I was doing. You know, I was like a little mouse hiding. She's not a mouse. She's a roaring lion, <laughs> you know. And I don't want to kill that. that. That's a beautiful personality. That's going to make her a great person. That's going to make her accomplish great things. I want to channel it so it's not destructive, that it's helpful. That's what we need to do with each other. And Paul, of course, concludes 
with this verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now many times we look at this and say, oh, okay, do not grieve. Obviously, the idea is to sadden, to bring sorrow. If we do these things, if we're lying to each other, if we're destroying each other, if we're gossiping, we're slandering, uh, we're stealing, we're doing all these things, horrible things, we are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. We're making Him sad. But there's more to it than that. Uh, and here, you know, uh, if, you, if you want to take your good notes here, Paul is actually again refer referencing Isaiah chapter 63, verses 9 and 10, where God says that he will redeem his people, he will call them out, he will bring them, he will rescue them, and yet they will still rebel against him. And it will grieve his Holy Spirit, and he will bring judgment on them. So there's a lot more connected with grieving the Holy Spirit and say, oh, when I sin, well, okay, I make the Holy Spirit sad. Too bad, <laughs> I'm still going to sin. No, no, no. That gr grieving God, divine sorrow, is the beginning of divine judgment. <laughs> Just think, think about it that way. Divine sorrow is the beginning of divine judgment. To hurt God's heart means that you've now stepped on a path where he is going to bring judgment for what you've done, especially to his children, to correct us if we're sinning. Uh, so we need to know that the God we serve is a holy God. That he does not like sin. And that if we do these things, not only are we hurting his Holy Spirit, he will eventually turn and judge us. He will eventually uh, bring us to account. We are the body of Christ. We are connected to each other. We need each other. We are important to each other. We cannot function without each other. Don't think that it's an imaginary thing. We are in Christ. We belong to Him. And by being in Christ, we are a part of each other. What we do harms not only us, it harms others within the body of Christ. Kindness. Kindness. To be kind towards each other. These are some of the things we do if we are kind and caring towards each other. May the Lord bless you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We ask, dear God, that your Holy Spirit would just cement these words in our minds and our hearts that we may glorify you in all that we do. We thank you, dear Lord, for all your mercies. Magnify yourself now and always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.